Today I'm going to take a look at five free Lightroom alternatives. This month my Adobe subscription is up for renewal, so I've had a look at these five free alternatives to Lightroom to see how they compare. I'm not sure whether to renew my Adobe subscription or go with one of the paid packages or one of the free packages. So today I'm looking at those free ones. You can download these now and start giving them a go. The links are in the description. And that's the great thing with these free bits of software. You don't have to commit or make a decision in the seven days or 30 days or however long it is that some paid programs and apps give you as a, a free trial period. So you'll always have it on your computer and you can always use it and have access to it. Therefore, if you don't want to buy software to edit your photos or your Adobe subscription is up for renewal like mine, you might want to have a look at these five. Now there are plenty more out there, but these seem to be the top ones that I've found. So if I have missed any that you think are worthy of looking at, let me know in the comments below. Darktable is an open source post-processing program. It supports raw files from over 400 different cameras and opens a whole host of different file types. When you open it up, it looks a lot like Lightroom. You have a film strip along the bottom, which can either be images or a timeline of when you took the photographs. Your selected photo is in the middle window. There are panels either side and you have the modules in the top right hand corner. When importing, it doesn't move the images or give you an option to store them in a different place. It just looks at them and expects them to be in their current location. So if you have them on your SD card, make sure you copy them to your hard drive before importing them to Darktable. When making changes, I found Darktable to be a little bit laggy on my system compared to Lightroom. So if I move one of the sliders, it takes a short while to respond and show what I've done and those changes I've made in the image. Now this could just be my system, but side by side Lightroom does seem to be a lot more responsive. One thing I do when going through a lot of images is to give them a star rating in Lightroom to quickly cull the rubbish ones. In Lightroom, I use the left and right cursors to go through the images and then the numbers one to five to star rate them. With Darktable, you can do this, but you use the space bar to move forward along the time strip and delete to move back, and then numbers one to five to star rate them again, like in Lightroom. But the position of my hand was a little bit uncomfortable compared to holding my fingers over the cursors. So for me, Darktable is a little bit uncomfortable to do this process. Now there are a list of shortcuts which are customizable, so you could change these to the cursors if that's something you like to do with your images. And whilst we're on the subject of shortcuts, I use these all of the time in Lightroom. And it's one of the things that once you learn them, it can really speed up your workflow. However, with Darktable, it doesn't seem to use the generic shortcuts on the Mac like Command Z to undo, which seems a bit weird as everyone or most people do know about those generic shortcuts. After a while, I worked out that they use CTRL regardless of whether you're on a Mac or a PC. So if you are a Mac user, undo is Control Z and not Command Z. Now this may not seem much to a PC user who is used to Control Z, but for a Mac user, when you have built in your muscle memory to Command Z, it gets a little bit annoying. I found that when I wanted to undo a task, I was always going for a Command Z, the computer wouldn't do anything, and then I had to go, right, it's Control Z. So you're kind of switching backwards and forwards. And then if you're using other programs on your Mac that use Command Z, that's when it gets really confusing because you've got to cross between the two. So if you are thinking of coming across from Lightroom, you might want to change these shortcuts to mirror Lightroom. This would then make the transition a little bit easier. At the moment, you can't build stitched images in Darktable. So things like panoramas and then stitched images where you might want to shoot wider than your lens allows. So you would need a plugin or a third party app to stitch them together. A little bit like PTGUI or something similar. However, you can take bracketed images so you can create HDR blended stacked images. If you tag and put keywords on your images, you can do this in the light table module, which is similar to the library in Lightroom. Now at the moment, as of the making of this video, there is no mobile compatibility. So no syncing across platforms and continuing to edit your photos on the way to work, on your tablet or on your phone. Now it might sound like I'm bashing Darktable, but it does have some really cool features like Bloom, where it gives you a look similar to the Orton effect. 
Now, if you don't know what that is, Nick Page did a great video on it. So click on the eye in the corner or the link in the description to his video on the Orton effect. Framing is another great one as you can frame up your shots really quickly and easily. And this leads me on to the amount of features in this program. This is where Darktable does push ahead of Lightroom. There are so many, and I could probably make a video about two hours long going through each one of these, but I was surprised as to how much control you have over each and every one of the settings. Now, it's not quite as powerful as Photoshop, but some of the settings do look similar if you're used to that editing program. For instance, the color balance tools are very much like that in Photoshop. Some features have sliders and others have much more in-depth features. For example, when sharpening, you have the three sliders, which are radius, amount, and threshold, very much like in Lightroom. Whereas if you click on the color balance that I've already mentioned, it's much more advanced than Lightroom. Overall, once I got the hang of it and I found all of the shortcut keys I'm used to, it really did feel very much like Lightroom. It just takes a little bit of getting used to to the different features and how they're laid out compared to Lightroom. In saying that, Back in 2009, when I first got into Lightroom, it did take me a while and it did seem really daunting. So I can understand how a program like this might seem very overwhelming, but if you get into it properly and learn the program by bringing your images into that program and just editing them and exploring them, because it is a non-destructive editor, it's not gonna to touch your files at all, even if you make lots of different changes. If you do that, you'll be surprised at how fast you'll actually learn to use that program properly. Now, if this is your first editor you're gonna get into, I'd say get the manual and take some time to read through it properly, and then try the different things you're learning in your own copy of the program with your own images as you go through that manual. Then you'll get the best out of it, and before you know it, you'll be using it to really bring out the best in your photos. Pixlr is very much like Photoshop in the way that it works with layers, and that layout is very reminiscent of Photoshop as well. It's an online editor, so all you need is a Google Chrome browser with an internet connection. Now this gives us our first disadvantage, which is that you do need an internet connection. When you open it up, it does give you a series of templates. So this is also a little like the website Canva. Another disadvantage is that it doesn't allow raw files, just JPEGs, PNGs, or Photoshop images. So if you do have raw files, you could save it as a PSD file and then bring it into this online editor. But in saying that, you would need a program to do that conversion in the first place. So if you shoot raw, this probably isn't the program for you. Now in this program, they really seem to push the filters and layers. With the layers, you can do local adjustments and obviously filters are a bit like the preset in Lightroom. So you have a predetermined look that you can drop onto your image and then manipulate with those layers. Like I've already said, this is very much a Photoshop based editor rather than a Lightroom based editor. It is great for building thumbnails, composite images and basically layering up your images and your photographs. It's not as detailed as Photoshop, but if you're not sure about Photoshop and you find it a little bit daunting, it is worth trying out as it's free. And if you like this layout, you'll probably like, and you'll probably want to get into Photoshop over Lightroom. Talking of being free, the basic package is free and you can do a lot with this but they do have adverts to cover their costs. Now, if you want to get rid of these adverts, they do have two paid options and they're a subscription model. It's either $7.99 per month or $29.99 per month, depending on which package you take. Or if you pay upfront annually, it's $4.90 per month or $14.99 per month. This includes their AI tools, overlay stickers, different texts, tutorials, and support in the premium plan. So as they don't allow you to work with raw files, if you were thinking of paying for this, it will be worth getting the photo package from Adobe instead, as you get so much more with that. You get Photoshop and Lightroom, and you don't have to convert your raw files before editing them. Raw Therapy is another very detailed open source post-processing program. It can be used as a standalone editor or as a raw loader for programs such as GIMP. Once again, it's a non-destructive program, so your starting images won't be touched, just red. It looks a little bit different to Lightroom, but has very similar features. In their About section on their website, it does say, Raw Therapy benefits users who take the time to learn what it can do. 
so this implies that it's a complex program. It does concentrate on raw files, but also reads other formats as well, and the raw support it gives is outstanding. From using two demosaicing algorithms on the same image, compositing pixel shift raw files, multiple frame raw files, dot frame subtraction, and hot pixel correction, it definitely does a lot. So basically, it blends raw files, looks at raw files, reads them really well, and removes a lot of the imperfections that might be in those raw files, which is all welcomed. Over on the left-hand side, you have what would be modules in Lightroom, and this consists of the editor, the queue, and the file browser. I keep all of my images on an external hard drive, and it did have a hard time reading that. I couldn't get it to see the files on the hard drive, which was really annoying. If you are looking for your external hard drives, they'll be located in the volumes folder. I ended up having to transfer them to the hard drive on my computer to get the program to see them. The file browser is a bit like the library module in Lightroom, but it's very different. It looks at the files in the folders on your hard drive, but doesn't import them into the program. Once you see your images in the middle in the file browser, you double click on them and then it opens them in the editor module. It reminds me of Adobe Bridge, which is the file manager from Adobe and was very popular before Lightroom came along. Like in the Lightroom library module, you can rate, search, as well as some other basic editing processes. And you can also find your camera settings you used for each image. One thing I liked about this is the inspection tab. This zooms in and allows you to look at the image closely and it's really quick. I didn't see any lagging when using this function, so when rating your images, you can very quickly use this to see if you've got the focus right in each and every shot. There are also a few other tabs next to inspect. These are filter, but not as in preset filters. This is to filter through your images to find what you're looking for, from a specific setting to a given lens. Then there's batch edit, which does exactly that. You edit a series of images with the same settings. Also, there's fast export. So this is where you could quickly export your images if you need some to show your friends, family, or a client that you're working for. Now with Lightroom, you import the image into the catalog and it keeps a reference file in that catalog. But with this, it just seems to look in a specific folder you've told it to. So if you have your images all over the place or on different hard drives, this could be an issue. So you really do have to be good with your file management on your hard drives. Whereas with Lightroom, you bring them into Lightroom and it shows them up on the film strip no matter where they are in your system. Now the Q tab on the left hand side gives you your export options. Whether you're going to do bulk exporting or just doing the odd file, this is where you would set your export parameters depending on what you are going to use the image for. The editor tab is obviously where you edit your photos. And when you click on an image and open this up, this is quite different from Lightroom. The film strip is along the top, the photo you work on is in the middle, and then there are two panels down either side. On the left-hand side, you have the histogram, navigator, history, and snapshots. And on the right-hand side, you have all of your editing tools. Above and below the main image, you have a set of tools that you might use more often than others. From showing your clipped highlights and crushed shadows, to the current size you're zoomed in on, and plenty more. When it comes to editing your photos, the panel down the right-hand side is extensive to say the least. There is a slider for pretty much anything you would ever want. You have seven tabs along the top of the right-hand panel, including exposure, detail, color, advanced, transform, raw, and metadata. It does have more features and refined controls than Lightroom, but not as many as Photoshop. Above this, there is the profiles panel, and this is where you can drop certain edits onto a photo. These are very much like the presets in Lightroom. You can load up profiles from other people, create your own, or copy and paste them from other images. Again, this is a very detailed editor, and the best way to learn it fully is to read through the manual and then try out the things it teaches you. There is also an extensive online community around this program, so if you did start using it and had a few issues, I'm sure you'd be able to find a solution to the problem. After editing with raw therapy, I found that there was a little bit of a lag when moving the sliders. A little bit more than Lightroom, but not as much as Darktable. So it's faster than Darktable, but slower than Lightroom. The Polar Photo Editor is very much like a tablet or phone editor. It is based around filters, but does have some deeper editing tools. But these are similar to the tools in the basic panel in the Lightroom Develop module. 
You do have curves and split toning, which is really good. Then there's a distortion tool to correct your lens imperfections and a border tool to frame your shot. It also has a gradient tool and brushes to do local adjustments. So again, this is really powerful and you can really make parts of your image stand out. Now there is a caveat to this. A lot of these are pro features and have limits. With the free version, you can only export one image per day unless you upgrade to Polar Pro, which is again, a subscription-based model with a price of $3.99 per month or $19.49 per year. So it's quite reasonable, but it's still that subscription model. Lightroom Classic does make this look very basic, but it does remind me of Lightroom CC. So if you want a lot of decent editing tools for raw files, I'd go with either Darktable or Raw Therapy and take the time to learn that program you choose properly. However, with the likes of Snapseed being free, if you do like this type of editor, that seems to be the one that would be well worth going for because it has all of those Pro Tools and it's completely free. The only thing to take into consideration with Snapseed is that you can't edit on the Mac. There was, I think, one for the PC, but you can't edit on the Mac unless you get, I think there was a plugin or something like that. It just seemed a little bit too complicated. But if you do use a tablet and you do like editing on a tablet, I'd go for Snapseed over this program. Now, Lightzone looks like it could be a good editor on the same level as Darktable and Raw Therapy. However, I couldn't get it to work on my system and looking at the comments for the 4.2.2 release, it looks like I'm not alone. It took me a while to find the download files. My Mac said there could be malware as it's not a trusted website, but I kind of bypassed that anyway and opened it on my computer. And this is where it opens the program with the start page, but then doesn't open a window. It just flashes a scanning pictures pop-up. This then disappears and it never opens a window. This is really annoying as I was looking forward to using this editor to see what it could do. If anyone has successfully got this to work, let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below and I'll pin your comment if you've got some good points. And also let me know how you got it to work. I'd really like to get it to work on my Mac, but it doesn't seem to work on it at the moment. Now, the one thing that developers really need to do is to make sure the software is stable and it works on all of the platforms that they say it's meant to work on. Once I build my Windows machine, I'm gonna try this again on that platform. Now, I'm guessing that the developers are mostly Windows users, so this might be the issue where they're not paying as much attention with the Mac version. But on the other hand, as all of you that are Sony users are finding with the Mac systems in upgrading the firmware, it could be the Mac system rejecting it as their security systems are getting stronger and they're getting harder to work around. Either way, it was frustrating to go through the whole process of installing it to have it not work. All in all, there are some great free photo editors out there. They range from the very basic editors like Polar through to the very in-depth Darktable and Raw Therapy or Pixlr if you're used to the Photoshop way of editing, but don't want the monumentally powerful and daunting program that is Photoshop. Now, some of them do offer pro level editing on a subscription model, but I'm guessing as you're watching this video, that is not what you're after. However you edit your photos is up to you. But the great thing with all of these is that they're all free. So if you can't afford the Adobe Photo package or just don't like signing up for the subscription packages that we keep getting bombarded with, you might as well try some of these as they all are free. So with a little bit of time and effort, you can learn them and really start getting the best out of your photographs. Now, what do you edit in? Do you edit in Lightroom or Photoshop or another program altogether? And have you tried any of these free programs or do you use one of these as your main editing program? If so, let me know in the comments below. It'll be great to hear your thoughts. And if you like this video and want to learn more, click here next. Or if you're a binge watcher like I am, click down here. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for two new videos every week. I'll see you next time.